Senior Plasma Physics Lecture 11. We now move on to a new topic called gaseous electronics or discharge physics. Most plasmas generated on Earth consist of three species. That is, you have the ions and the electrons, but they're mostly made up of neutral atoms and molecules. In fact, the densities of electrons and ions are a very small fraction of the densities of the neutral atoms and molecules. One exception to Earth-based plasmas is the plasma used in nuclear fusion research where it needs to be fully ionized. However, most industrial and commercial plasmas are not. Because of the high density of the neutral atoms and molecules, collisions between them and the electrons and ions becomes quite significant. We need to look at a few concepts surrounding collisions, such as cross-sections, the mean free path, ionization, recombination, and finally, diffusion. A central parameter to the study of collisions in a plasma is the cross-section. When electrons collide with gas particles or ions, several reactions are possible. The electrons could ionize the gas, they could impart momentum to it, they could excite the energy levels of the electrons around the molecules and ions. They could recombine with the ions. And there are many more reactions, but we will only look at a few. No matter which of these you look at, the end result is that the electrons lose energy. But this is a stochastic process where we are dealing with the probability of a collision taking place. We introduce the idea of cross-section, sigma which has units of area, which is essentially the area available for the electron for a collision to take place. Let's pick on an example to see what this means. Let's consider the ionization of a hydrogen atom. This is a plot of the cross-section sigma on the y-axis versus the electron energy on the x-axis. As you can see, the electron energy starts to become non-zero for energies greater than 13.6 electron volts because that is the minimum ionization energy for a hydrogen atom. You'll notice that the units of sigma are meter squared. Now, classically, you would expect that the target atom, in this case hydrogen, will present a fixed target area since the size of the atom is fixed. But that is not what you see in the graph. You see the graph rise to a maximum and then descend slowly with increasing energy, as if the area of the atom is changing. The reason that there is a change in the cross-section is that we are not dealing with classical physics. Collisions are essentially quantum mechanical because the incoming wave function of the electron mixes with the wave function of the electrons around the atom. And that affects the probability of the incoming electron causing the atom to be ionized. Let's look at other cross-sections. In this case, it's the cross-sections for elastic collisions of incoming electrons with target atoms, such as neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. Although they have the same general shape, that is, they rise to a maximum, and then start to descend an asymptote to a particular value for high energies, you'll notice that the larger the atom, the larger the cross-section. So there is still some element of intuition about it, except the shape of the curve. We stated previously that the cross-section is somehow related to the probability of a collision. Let's look at this explicitly. We start by considering a plasma slab of thickness dx and a cross-sectional area of A. We now have an electron beam heading towards the slab and we need to work out the probability of these electrons striking an atom in the slab as they traverse to the other side. The collision probability is given by this equation where n is the total number of atoms in the slab and sigma is the cross-sectional area of each atom. And we divide by the total area of the slab. So this is the ratios of the area taken up by the atoms divided by the total area of the slab. 
You can view this as also being the fraction of atoms that undergo a collision. We now need to work out an expression for the number of atoms in the slab. This is given by the number density of the atoms multiplied by the volume of the slab. If we now substitute n back into the expression for the probability, we obtain this. We can cancel out a, and so the whole expression simplifies to this. Note that although this is the probability of the slab, it is really the probability of an infinitesimally thin slab. We'll see shortly how to handle a much thicker slab. Let's now look at collisions through a plasma that's much larger than an infinitesimally thin slab. To work out the average path length traveled by electrons between collisions, let's consider again the infinitesimally thin slab and assume that there are n electrons heading towards it and n prime electrons leaving it. As we said previously, the fraction of electrons blocked by atoms in the slab is really equal to the probability of a collision in the slab. The fraction of electrons blocked by atoms in the slab is given by the difference between the number of atoms entering and exiting the plasma divided by the number of atoms entering. Because it's an infinitesimally thin plasma, then the difference between n prime and n becomes dn. Notice that there is a minus sign at the front because n prime will always be less than n. We now equate this to the probability of a collision that we derived previously. And we now integrate this equation. Rearranging this, we get this expression. What does this expression mean? n on the left hand side is the number of electrons that are left without a collision after they travel a distance x through the plasma. n naught is the initial number of electrons. We can rewrite this expression in the following compact form, where lambda subscript m is this. 1 on n sigma is known as the mean free path. It is basically the average distance traveled by electrons between collisions. As well as the mean free path, it's also very useful to define the collision frequency. The average time between collisions, tau, can be written as the mean free path, lambda, divided by the speed. We define the collision frequency to be the inverse of tau, which is v on lambda. Substituting the expression for lambda, which if you remember is 1 on n sigma, we have this. This equation is fine if we have a single value for v, but the issue is that most of the time we don't we have a distribution of velocities, f of v. So we need to take an average of sigma v. It's done by weighting sigma v with the distribution function f of v, and then integrating. At the moment, it's not clear why we do this, because we have not really delved into what the distribution function means. Its explanation will be given in the kinetic theory part of the course. At the moment, you can look at f of v dv to be the same as a probability function. On the left hand side, sigma v bar is the average value of sigma v. And if the plasma is highly collisional, f of v is taken to be a Maxwellian. We now have the mathematical tools to work out the rate of reactions in a plasma. We'll start by looking at the rate of ionization of a gas. Imagine we have a gas and we apply an electric field. We rely on ambient free electrons to be accelerated by the field and collide with an atom, such as this. A number of reactions could occur. You could have elastic collisions, as in this case, or there could be ionization, or a number of reactions. In this example, we'll just look at ionization and elastic collisions. So the scenario presented here is that the electron collides with an atom and only undergoes an elastic collision. It then goes on to be accelerated further and perhaps undergo another elastic collision. Further acceleration could perhaps result in ionization and the subsequent electrons produced from that ionization can go on to be accelerated 
and either undergo elastic collisions or ionization collisions. Because this is a stochastic process, we can come up with a rate equation, that is, the rate at which certain reactions are expected to occur. As an example, let's use the ionization of hydrogen atoms. Ionization can be symbolized by this chemical equation. On the left hand side, we have an electron undergoing a collision with a neutral hydrogen atom. On the right hand side is the result of an ionization, where we end up with an ionized hydrogen atom, essentially a proton, plus the original electron and the electron produced from ionization, so that's two electrons. The rate of this ionization is given by the following. On the left hand side of this equation, we would like to determine the rate of ionization per unit volume. On the right hand side, this is determined by the collision frequency times number of electrons per unit volume. Mathematically, this is given by this, where n subscript h plus is the number density of hydrogen ions. We can now use the term we derived earlier for the collision frequency, n sigma h, where n subscript h is the hydrogen atom number density times the electron number density. We can also find out the rate of the reverse process, that is, the rate of recombination. It's given by this chemical equation, where on the left hand side is the electron undergoing a collision with a hydrogen ion. On the right hand side, we have the resulting neutral hydrogen atom. Again, we can rewrite this as a rate equation, dn dt, just as we did for the ionization rate, except this is the reverse process. The left hand side is the number of hydrogen atoms produced per unit volume per unit time. Note that sigma vn is the collision frequency. Quite often, sigma v is written as alpha and is known as the recombination coefficient. Another process in a plasma that involves collisions is diffusion. The way we quantify diffusion is that we revisit the fluid equation of motion for electrons given by this expression but without a magnetic field. We then include this collision term, which you'll note includes nu, the collision frequency. For simplicity, we make the following assumptions. The plasma has reached a steady state. dV dt must then be equal to zero. We'll also assume that V is so small that the second order term, such as the convective term, vanishes. And we use the ideal gas law in place of the term for pressure. We finally obtain the following. This term is usually labeled as mu and is called the mobility. This term is given the label d. If we now multiply both sides by the number density n, we end up with the following equation. You'll notice that nv is nothing more than the expression for flux that we've met in a previous lecture. If the mobility mu is zero, perhaps the collision frequency is quite high, therefore resulting in very small mobility, we end up with the following expression, which is the classic diffusion law called Fick's law, and relies on the density gradient of a certain species, where d is called the diffusion coefficient.